we, I gave you seven points that were uh, really just common sense um, methods in which we are going to handle the scriptures, right? You remember that what those, did you guys write them down? Anybody, did anybody write them down? Carl did. Good. All right. Let's hear them. What are they? One. The word is infallible. All right. The Bible's infallible. The scriptures are infallible. Now, what we mean by that is the Bible's never wrong. But also keep in mind that that doesn't mean that your particular version of the Bible is never wrong. All right, there are many different translations of the Bible, and they don't all agree with each other. All right, so there are errors in translations, in individual translations. But when God uh, delivered the Bible, that is the prophets and the apostles, when they wrote it down, they wrote it down perfectly. It has been preserved over the centuries through many different copies. Okay, there's a multitude of copies. Sometimes people made mistakes while they copied them, but by comparing lots of copies, you can, we can generally weed that out. All right? So we're not saying that this particular translation is perfect. What we're saying is when God delivered the Bible and it's an original form, it was absolutely perfect. What we're going to do is we're going to compare different translations and different manuscripts from time to time in order to uh, see what the, you know, uh, if we can determine which one is the correct readings. All right, what was the second point? Uh, all right, what was that, Thelma? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear you. Okay, grammar. Grammar is very important, right? All right, we're not going to transgress the grammar. There are going to be times when we actually look at the grammar and we have to explain the grammar of a particular passage because it may make all the difference in the world for how we understand that. What's the, what's the third one? Interpret with the historical setting. All right. So, you know what, Thelma? You're on top of things, and you weren't even here last week. She went online and watched the video. Isn't that great? Let's give her a hand. <laughs> all right. Hey, if you have to miss a class, that's the thing you need to do. All right. You need to uh, go online, watch the video, because if you, if you miss a class and you don't catch up during the week, then you're going to not know what we're talking about in the next class, because every class builds on the previous class. Okay. All right. So historical context, what does that mean? Somebody explain that to me just in a couple of sentences. Go ahead, George. Right. Right. So, right. That, that requires that we understand a little bit about their culture, a little bit about the particular circumstances that they were in, and, and who they were and what their background was, right? Okay, what's the, what's the next one? I'm, I'm sorry, you have to speak louder. Whoever said it. Carl, go ahead. Okay, can anybody tell me what that means? Progressively means in the right order, right? Why is that important? First of all, what is the right order? It's the order in which God gave these, revealed these things. All right, the order that God revealed these things. The Bible was written over a period of many centuries by many different people. But when God, but particularly through the nation of Israel, right? But, right, it's, it's chronologically the way in which God revealed it because every time he revealed something new, He's building upon what he had already revealed in the past. He's not contradicting the past. All right, that's the, that's the key that we have to, we really have to understand this, is that God doesn't contradict himself, number one, but he's not going to contradict what he's already said. Yes? I'm reading your book, The Hand of Time. Yeah. And when uh, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit, Nothing was what? I'm not sure. At the time of the apostles? Yeah. Oh, no. The whole Old Testament was written at the time of the apostles. Jesus was constantly quoting from it. No, the Old Testament was all written long before Jesus ever came on the scene or the apostles. And who wrote, who wrote it? The prophets, Moses and the prophets, wrote the Old Testament. They lived long before Jesus did. All right, so when we're talking about interpreting the Bible progressively, we're, what we're saying is when we look at what Jesus said to his disciples or what the Apostle Paul might have written, it's with the understanding of all that has come before it. It's this whole background from the Old Testament that God had revealed through Moses and through the prophets 
and we have that body of information, that should be our background material for what we see being said in the New Testament. See, if we approach the Bible from a completely different perspective, like from a Western perspective, without that, that kind of Jewish way of thinking that is revealed throughout the Old Testament, then we're going to misunderstand concepts and misunderstand uh, statements that are being made because we're viewing it from, from a completely different perspective. All right? That's what, that's what that's all about. All right, what's the next one? Okay. Our, whatever our doctrines are. Now, the, the Bible gives us many different doctrines. That is, many teachings on various topics of Scripture, right? There are many, there's, there's, we're, we went over the doctrine of God, which is all of what the Bible has to say about God. We, we're now talking about the doctrine of man, what the Bible has to say about man. Now, these are two different doctrines, and there are many more doctrines from the Bible. What we want to see is that all of these doctrines are in harmony with each other, and they don't conflict with each other. All right. In the end, all of it has to be harmonious. And, and there can't be logical contradictions between doctrines about God and doctrines about man or, do, or other doctrines. Everything must be harmonious and fit together in a whole so that um, there is no internal conflict between these ideas. All right. That's all, that's all that that means. All right. All right. What's, what's the other one? All right, this one is really, really critical. The Bible has a lot to say about God and his nature and what he will do, what he will not do, what is consistent with his character, what is not consistent with his character. The Bible has a lot to say about that. And if we have doctrines about whatever it is, and in the end that doctrine clashes with what the Bible says about God and his nature, then there's something wrong. We're misunderstanding something, all right? We're bringing wrong ideas to the text or something because whatever God has revealed is never going to be contrary to his, his own nature, all right? This is a very critical one. What's the other one? There's one more. Okay, what that, what that means is essentially we want to kind of get a, an idea of where did these various ideas come from, right? The idea, like we talked about the three views of man, right? There's three different, pretty much everybody in the world has held at least one of these three views of what a man is and what his destiny is. And <clears throat> these ideas came from somewhere. They started somewhere, all right? And they developed amongst different groups of people at different times. And having an idea of the history of where these ideas came from and how they, some of them have become part of Christianity, some of them have not. Um, having a sense of where they came from really helps you get an idea of what is really right and what is really wrong. If it comes from, a, you know, it, one of the things that, it, it, it's, um, you might want to uh, plug your ears if you're offended by crude language, but one of the things I used to tell my girls when they started dating was, if you fish in the sewer, you're going to catch a turd. Okay, it's a good expression uh, if you, any of you guys have daughters. <laughs> um, but that's, that's pretty much what happens, all right? If a particular doctrine came from a stinky source, it's really kind of what Jesus said about a good, a good uh, well bringing forth good water and a bad well bringing forth bad water and, and all that, all right? It's the same idea. Now, um, one of the things that I need to um, point out was I actually left one very important principle off of that list so you need to add this to your list there's actually going to be eight points you ready you writing you writing <clears throat> all right and this is this is it literal teaching has priority over non-literal speech that is parables visions dreams things like that now what do I mean by that if the Bible, it, it, let's say the Apostle Paul is writing and he's teaching about the subject of the resurrection. And he's just using plain, ordinary speech. And he's explaining something. And you, you see what he has to say. And then, let's say John saw a vision about something and we might infer something about the resurrection from his vision. But it's not actually stated. Which one of those should be the foundational principle that we use and we, and we try to interpret the other in light of this one? 
Which one should carry the most weight? Literal plain teaching, okay? Because visions, dreams, allegories, parables, things like that, they all need an explanation. And sometimes there is an explanation given, sometimes there's not an explanation given, right? Like, for example, Jesus gave some parables sometimes, and he would, he would like the parable of the wheat and the tares. So he talked about how that, uh, you know, somebody planted the wheat, and then his enemy came and planted tares among the wheat. And you can hear the parable, and you can say, okay, well, I know what that means. It teaches blah, 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 blah. Well, that's right. And you, well, you might be right, okay? But if you read farther down in the chapter, the disciples came and asked Jesus, tell us the meaning of the parable. And then Jesus explained what all these things were. Now, what do we have here? We have both the symbolic and we have the literal teaching, which is Jesus' explanation of it. Right? Which one carries the real weight? Jesus' explanation. Because if you just look at the parable, you might interpret it 10 or 15 different ways. Okay, what does the wheat represent? Well, I don't know. I think it represents a good harvest. <laughs> I mean, you can interpret it lots of different ways. All right? Allegories, parables visions, dreams, unless the actual explanation for what they mean is given. Yes, we consider those things, but we always interpret those things in light of what is plainly stated about the subject in the scripture. Does that make sense? Plain literal speech, all, especially if it's teaching, always takes precedence or has priority over non-literal forms of speech. All right, does everybody comprehend what I'm, what I'm saying? All right. All right, that'll keep us from making um, a lot of mistakes. Now, here's what I want to... Um, we gave you these three basic views of what, um, what a man is and what happens to a man. If you remember, there was one primary question that had that I mean you know we when we uh, we've all heard the uh, the saying about you know why am I here and who am I and why am I here and all that kind of stuff you know people ask those those supposedly deep philosophical questions about you know what's the purpose of life that kind of thing well people have grappled with those kinds of questions from from the very beginning but one question that is really pr very primary it's really a foundational philosophical question is, is there ultimately justice in this world? Because when you, look out, when you look out and see what's happening, what do you see? You see people out there uh, killing. You see crime. You see people getting away with murder. You see people injuring other people. You see theft. You see all kinds of, you see there's a lot of bad people out there, and a lot of them get away with a lot of really bad stuff. And there's some really good people out there who try to live by a higher standard, right? And so the question is, is there ultimately justice in this life? Is there, is, is it, do we just have to accept that bad things are going to happen to good people and sometimes good things happen to bad people? They live their whole life and they steal and everything and they live high on the hog. And then in the end, you know, they don't pay for all that. Yeah, Jordan? Saul and Dana that whole issue of Ecclesiastes. Yes, he did. He, he was he's promoting how the people that get away with breaking. In this breaking. life only. Yeah. But see, that's, that's where the rubber starts to hit the road, okay? Is there ultimately justice in this world? Well, if you look at during our lifetime, is there justice? No, but see what, what Solomon constantly was talking about, and David as well. If you read Psalm 37, where he talks about, don't fret about the fact that the wicked are, are prospering and, and, all, and all that they have, they've accumulated all this stuff. He said their day is coming and they're going to pay. They're going to stand before God and they're going to pay, right? So Solomon, both Solomon and David answered that question, and that is, Ultimately, there will be justice for every single person who has ever lived. There will be justice. Is it going to be in this life? No. It's going to be after this life. And if there's justice after this life, then there has to be something beyond death. Isn't that right? 
There has to be something beyond death because people have to stand and give an account to a higher authority and then they have to either have reward or they have to have punishment. That's really the ultimate question. Now, all these three views that we talked about are people grappling with the, this concept and how it works out in the end, whether there is going to be justice in the end or not. We talked about different groups of people who had different views. Now, the first one, immortality of the soul, has the idea that a man consists of a physical body, but his real person is not physical. His real person is something else. It's a, we call it a ghost because I think that's a term that uh, people understand, right? You have a, the, per, the real person is not physical. The real person is a ghost. He's living in a physical form, but if the physical form dies, he can dispose of that form and he can continue to live. All right, now it's called immortality of the soul because the basic concept is that this invisible person will live forever. Immortality means what? Live forever. Okay, immortality means you never die. So the concept of immortality of the soul essentially says that a man or a woman is going to live forever, period. Not necessarily with the body, okay? But is going to live forever. Even if you shed the body, you live forever. So that, that whole concept was, was trying to deal with this idea of whether there is to be justice in the afterlife. All right, so if the person is going to live forever, then they can, you can say, well, when he sheds his body, he can stand before God, God can judge him, and God can reward or punish. All right, That's, that was uh, basically the idea with that one. Well, the second, the second one, conditional immortality, deals with it in a different way. It doesn't, it doesn't hold that man is sort of uh, able to live outside of his body. He is a living flesh being, okay? And if you kill the body... The person is dead. Well, they, there's only one way there can be retribution or, pun, or punishment or reward in that kind of a scenario. And what is that? Resurrection of the body. The only way there can be in any kind of afterlife, any kind of punishment, any kind of reward, is if the person is resurrected again in order to stand before judgment. And then he, is, he receives both reward or punishment in the body, in the flesh. All right? Okay, that's the second view. And then, of course, mortality is a, is a view that's basically what atheists hold, and that is that when you're dead, you're dead. There is no judgment. There is no responsibility. There is no reward. There is no punishment. Whatever reward or punishment you get, you get in this life, and that's all there is. Okay, those are the three views. Now, what I want to do uh, with the remainder of our time is I want to show you that all three of these views are very ancient. Very ancient. They can be traced back to Old Testament times. All right. So we're going to look at we're going to look at them. This is part of uh, what we talked about, looking at the history of various points of view. It's important to understand these, these this history. Go to uh, take your Bibles and go to Deuteronomy, chapter eighteen. Deuteronomy 18, we're going to start reading in verse 9. Everybody there? You guys are either really fast and really quiet or you're not turning. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When you come into the land, this is God uh, writing or speaking to Moses to uh, write this down for the children of Israel. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or the soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. Notice that. Notice that phrase. Now, the word up is not in the original language. It literally says one who inquires of the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers or diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Now, what is he saying? 
the nations around Israel, the, the pagan nations around Israel, they practiced all kinds of witchcraft, uh, you know, fortune telling, and necromancy was very common. What is necromancy? Anybody ever heard of a seance? You know what a seance is, right? Where you get a psychic or something, and they, uh, they try to call up the spirit of Uncle Joe to come up and speak to us, right? Okay, well, the pagans were practicing that kind of stuff. Now, what does that imply about which of these views they held? Which one? one. Number one? There, would everybody agree with that? That those pagans held the first view? They did. Calling up the dead, they believed the spirits of the dead were still conscious and that the spirit of the dead person could come into the medium, right, or, or, or psychic or whatever, and speak through that person. Now, this is what the pagans did. Now, what does God say about that? Abomination. It's an abomination to him. Now, some people might say, well, it's just an abomination to call them up or to try to communicate with them, but they're still there. But, well, that's a question for another day. All right? But the question that we're going to ask of the text is this. Who practiced this kind of thing? The pagans, right? Israel was forbidden, all right? God's people were forbidden for having anything to do with this kind of activity, all right? Now, did anybody from Israel actually dabble in this stuff? Saul. Saul. Who was Saul? King, right? And does anybody remember what the circumstance was? Wasn't he like, um, he needed to go out to battle and he wanted like help or some direction from Samuel? Like that, like, what's right. Going to go? Samuel was God's prophet, right? God spoke through his prophet Samuel to Israel. And Saul had transgressed against God, and God had said through Samuel to Saul, Saul, I'm done with you. I'm not going to speak with you anymore. You have transgressed against me and rebelled against my orders that I have given you. I'm done with you. I'm not going to speak with you anymore. In fact, um, that's exactly what he said. I'm not speaking with you anymore, Saul. Don't even come and ask me anymore. I'm done with you. Well, Saul, knowing this, and he also told him he was going to remove him from being king. Take the kingdom away from him. And here's Saul about to go into battle. And that's not the kind of news you want to hear when you're about to go into battle because, you know, you're probably going to die. <laughs> right? So Saul was kind of desperate. And so what did he do? He went to see one of these people, one of these people who supposedly communicate with the dead. Because Samuel had died, and he, and he knew Samuel was God's prophet. And so he decided he was going to go to this, uh, the witch of Endor and have her communicate with the dead spirit of, of Samuel. I mean, you guys, we, we've talked about this uh, before, and we're actually going to talk about that more, in more depth later, so I don't want to get too deep into it. But God condemned him for that as well. In fact, if you go to, um, go to 1 Chronicles chapter 10, <clears throat> 1 Chronicles 10, verse 13. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. So God killed Saul, not only for two reasons. He was unfaithful to God, but secondly, because he went to a medium to try to communicate with the dead. And so God schmucked him right there. All right. Now, so what we have seen so far, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you this is an absolute fact. In the Old Testament, all of this kind of activity is absolutely condemned by God. There is no case in the Old Testament where a faithful follower of God, of the God of Israel, had anything to do with this sort of activity, or there's no sign that they even held the view that the, the dead were conscious. There's no sign of that anywhere in the Old Testament. Right? And actually, we're going to look at uh, several passages from the Old Testament that show that they held the opposite view. All right. Now, let's look at... Um, so what, we, what we've shown is 
For the immortality of the soul, there were clearly pagans who held that view. Saul, who was an apostate from God, held that view. Now let's look at what some of the others in the Old Testament um, had to say about this. Um, actually, before we go there, let's look at uh, Acts chapter 17. The, the Greeks to whom the Apostle Paul uh, was preaching the gospel also held this view of the immortality of the soul. Uh, Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> Also, um, the, idea, the idea of the immortality of the soul, what is, what is a person who believes that, what was their hope for justice in the end? What was their hope? A person who believes in the immortality of the soul. Place yourself back in Old Testament times, okay, amongst these pagans. What did they believe? They believed that the spirit or soul, whatever you want to call it, the ghost of a person, separated from that person when their body died, but that there was some kind of reward or punishment in the afterlife okay, for that spirit or soul or ghost. So what was, what was their hope? That God would, yes, but, there, but, the, but the wicked would be punished as a ghost and that the righteous would be rewarded as a ghost. See, the one thing that is absolutely and conspicuously missing from all the pagan ideas about afterlife is resurrection. That was totally foreign to their way of thinking. However, with the Jews, it was exactly the opposite. Resurrection was their only hope of any kind of reward or punishment in the afterlife was resurrection. And we'll, I'll show you that in a few moments. But before we go there, I want to show you that the first one, immortality of the soul, was held even at the time of Jesus and the time of the apostles. It was held by the pagans. It was held by the Greeks, okay, the pagan Greeks. Now, in Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul was preaching. He went to uh, Athens, right there in the middle of Greece, the heart of Greek philosophy, and he began to give a sermon. Um, let's look at verse, um, <clears throat> actually, uh, let's, let's start in verse uh, 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. And they were very religious because they had many, many gods. For as I, pa as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life, uh, gives to all life, breath, and all things. That is, now right here, he, Paul's making a statement that is contrary to their, their own philosophy. Because they believed in the immortality of the soul. They believed that, that a person was, a, uh, was alive with or without the body. The person always would be alive. Right? And so what is he saying here? He's saying that God is the one who is sustaining all life. That's different than immortality of the soul. Because immortality of the soul has with, as its idea that life is inherent within the soul itself. That is, it's something that cannot be taken away. Therefore, a person is not being given life constantly. You know, you could say, well, his body is being given life. But ultimately, his, his real essence, his real person, his ghost, was going to live forever. The Apostle Paul, what he's saying here, is a little bit contrary to that. Because he's saying God is the one who is sustaining life and breath and all things. Verse 26, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, quote, for we are also his offspring. He there is quoting from a pagan poet. 
Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by the art of man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained and has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now he's talking about the resurrection of Christ, right? And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, <clears throat> and others said, we will hear again, hear you again on this matter. <clears throat> so Paul departed from among them, etc. Now, the idea that they mocked, they scoffed at the whole idea of resurrection. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that there is going to be retribution in the end, right? But the retribution in the end is by through one man, Jesus Christ, who is going to judge all flesh. And God has testified to this by raising him from the dead. And so they, mock, they mocked and scoffed about this whole concept of resurrection. Now, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> Corinth, the city of Corinth, which this uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians was written to the Christians who lived in the city of Corinth. That city was only a little, little ways away from Athens. It was just, it was almost like, they're almost like twin cities. All right, Corinth is just out, outside of Athens. And this is the, the whole uh, center of Greek philosophy where they have this mindset, okay? Plato was probably the most honored Greek philosopher in Athens at this time. And Plato was very, very big about this idea that the body is just a prison for the ghost. And that the, 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 the hope of these pagans and Plato and, all, and many of these other philosophers was to escape out of this physical form and ascend into heaven as pure spirit. Okay, that was their, their hope. It was not resurrection. Resurrection is, was the last thing they wanted because they thought that the flesh was keeping you down. The body is keeping you down. It's causing you to sin. It's causing you to, uh, you know, all the problems in your life is because you're made up of physical flesh. And if you can just escape out of that, then, you know, you can ascend and be some kind of vapor or something. Anyway, yes. Yeah, Catholics, Catholics do that a lot, self-flagellation, right? I mean, beating themselves and whipping themselves and all that. You've probably seen movies where the Catholic priests and stuff were doing this stuff. You know, it's, it's because they viewed the body as evil and the physical substance of the body as holding them down. And it, it was, a, you know, the idea was to beat up and punish the body um, as a way of, um, I don't know. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. All right, okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, what we have in this chapter is the church in Corinth, remember, these are Greek Christians. Growing up with all this Greek kind of thinking, they all, before they came to Christ, they all believed in the immortality of the soul. That was permeated their whole culture. They couldn't think of man any other, any other way than being a ghost in a flesh suit. All right, That's just the way they thought. <clears throat> and so Paul comes in and he preaches the gospel and he establishes this church. Now remember, just, just down the road in Athens, they're mocking the whole concept of resurrection, the Greeks were. Well, what, what's going to happen in that kind of a situation? Whenever you take somebody who has a totally different background and mindset and culture as opposed let's say let's say over on this side of the auditorium all of you are Greeks and you grew up in that mindset where immortality of the soul is just the way you think all right and then over here you folks are Jews and you have been raised with the concept that the only hope is resurrection all right that a man is is, is a single entity, and the only hope is a resurrection. All right. Now, Paul came from this group. He grew up with all that Old Testament way of thinking. right? And he comes over and he preaches about Jesus to this group over here who has that other mindset. Well, okay, after Paul leaves, this new church, they start looking at Paul's letters. They start listening, you know, remember what Paul said. But they also have this other way of thinking. What do you think might happen? 
maybe kind of a blending going on, maybe kind of starting to look at what Paul said, but look at it through your old lens, the way you used to look at things, right? Well, that's what happened to the church in Corinth. <clears throat> so look what, look what Paul says here in chapter 15. He says, um, uh, let's start in verse... Um, Let's see. All right, he, well, he start, in the first few verses, he talks about the fact that he and the other apostles were eyewitnesses of the fact that Jesus rose again. All right, that they, they had actually seen the risen Christ. So he's defending Christ's resurrection. And then he says in uh, verse 12, Now, if Christ is preached, that is, if we, the apostles, have preached to you that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That is, the whole, they were denying, some of these Christians in Corinth were denying the whole concept of resurrection as being the way in which God is going to solve this whole problem of justice. All right, they were denying that. But if there, Paul says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Now that follows logically, doesn't it? If the dead do not rise then Christ obviously could not have risen. So then he says, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. What Paul's doing is he's saying this is an essential part of the gospel. The hope of the resurrection is an essential part of the gospel. Verse 18, Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Now wait a minute. If the dead do not rise, look at this verse again. If the dead do not rise, Paul says that all the Christians who have died have perished. Did Paul believe in the immortality of the soul? How could he? How, they wouldn't have perished. They are ghosts all flow to the heaven. I mean, that's what's taught from most pulpits today, right? Paul says, no. If Christ didn't rise, then um, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. He used the perfect tense. They have already perished. That's literally what it means. If in this... Now notice this, verse 19. If in this life only... We have hope in Christ. We are of all men the most pitiable. What is he saying? If there is no resurrection, in this life, Paul says, we go, we're undergoing trial and tribulation and all this kind of stuff, right? And we have placed our hope in the resurrection. If there is no, if there is no resurrection that we are a miserable lot. Now, how could he say that if he believed that when we die, our ghosts fly away to heaven and we live in some state of bliss? We wouldn't be of all men most miserable. What he's saying is, without the resurrection, we're, we're completely lost. So he's saying our whole life is meaningless unless there's a resurrection. See, Paul, what Paul believed was conditional immortality. There's no doubt about it. There's many other passages that prove that. All right, let's look at... Um, um, let's look at what Job believed. Go to uh, Job chapter 19. Hey, yes, sir. In that verse, it says, and also those who have fallen asleep in Christ. Mm -hmm. um, is, isn't the verb like saying, like, those who have, and they're still, if they're, are, it's like, isn't like, are they still sleeping? Those who have fallen asleep. Or, yes. Like, it's, it's continuous, not just like they fell asleep once and it's stopped. Like, I don't know which verb, I mean, if it's, I don't know if it's a perfect tense verb or if it's an aorist tense verb. Um, if it's perfect tense, it means they're still asleep. If it's aorist tense, it's just talking about the fact that they fell asleep without saying anything about whether it's continuous or not. But either way, it wouldn't make, make any difference. It, the point is still the same. Um, go to Job chapter 19, if you would, please. <clears throat> this is the uh, first verse in the Bible that I know of, anyway, that talks specifically about the hope for justice after death. Okay? Um, Job chapter 19, and Job is one of the very first books written in the Bible. Uh, verse 25. It was Look. Before the Bible, wasn't 
Um, it, Job lived before Moses. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Yes. <clears throat> we don't know. We, we know Job lived before Moses. We don't know when his book was written exactly. It could have been written, you know, sometime after Moses. It could. It could have been just an oral tradition that was passed down and then written down, or it could have been written early on. But it doesn't make any difference. Job lived before Moses, who wrote Genesis. And here we learn from Job what the hope of the righteous, those who feared God, was. Verse 25, Job 19, 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And now notice this, verse 26. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Now, notice carefully what Job placed his hope in. Did Job place his hope in some glorious afterlife of his ghost? No. What was his hope? The resurrection. Notice he said, in the latter day, his Redeemer is going to stand on the earth which that's a long time in the future, way past Job's lifetime. In fact, Job thought he was going to die from his illnesses, by the way. Right? He's talking about way sometime in the distant future, he knows that his Redeemer is going to stand on the earth, and he knows that he is going to stand face to face and see him in the flesh with his own eyes. What does that mean? How is that possible? Does Job expect to live for thousands of years? Resurrection. Job's hope was in the resurrection of his body. He makes no mention whatsoever about any kind of intermediate state between those two things. He expected to die, and he expected to be raised again and look upon the face of his Redeemer with his own eyes, in the flesh. Right? Re right, resurrected in the flesh. He says, with my eyes, even though my skin has been destroyed, I know that even with my eyes I'm going to see him. That's part of your flesh. Right? That was Job's hope. Uh, let's look at uh, Luke chapter 20. Let's look what Jesus said here. Now, look back at this. Which one of these views did Job hold? Number two. Number two. Conditional immortality. All right. Go to um, Luke chapter 20. I know I'm going uh, past my time. I'm going into the question and answer time, but I want to try to finish this. We can have questions and answers a little after if you guys don't mind. Um, Luke 20 verse 27. Then some of the Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection came to him, that is Jesus, and asked him saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife, and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. That's part of the law of Moses. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her as a wife and died childless, and the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, now remember, the people who are asking the question don't believe there's a resurrection, all right? It started off by saying the Sadducees asked him, and the Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection. So what they're trying to do is trip Jesus up with a question he can't answer and therefore show that he's wrong. <laughs> all right? There is no resurrection. All right. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as a wife. What he's saying is, uh, Jesus, if you believe in a resurrection, and if Mo what Moses wrote was right, then that doesn't, that doesn't work. In this particular circumstance, it wouldn't work. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised, when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Now what is he saying? He said, look, even Moses showed that the resurrection is true. Even though Moses didn't specifically mention the resurrection, 
He implied the resurrection because in the burning bush, when God was in the burning bush speaking to Moses, he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when he said that, it implied that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have a future. Right? That they have a future. And, he's, and the reason he said that was because he is the one who's going to raise them back from the dead. That's the, the implication of what Jesus is talking about here. So Jesus condemns the third view, doesn't he? The Sadducees held this view. Mortality, that when you die, that's all there is. Jesus condemned them. He proved that the resurrection is true. He proved it from an inference from the books of Moses, or from what Moses said. But the point was, he's proving that there is a resurrection. Notice the hope, and this you will see this is very consistent in the Bible, both in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, and in the Epistles, and in Revelation. The hope laid before the righteous is never some kind of happy, intermediate phase between your death and and the resurrection. That is nowhere presented as the hope of a believer. The hope of a believer is always when he dies to sleep and in the resurrection to come back restored and to have eternal life in the kingdom with God. All right, that's consistent from beginning to end in the scriptures. All right, let's look at, um, uh, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> Now, this is a passage where if there was some sort of happy intermediate phase between death and resurrection for the ghost, this is the place where it should be found. What's the situation? Well, a lot of the Christians in, in Thessalonica had died. Many of them were being persecuted even unto death. And they had died, and their, their living relatives, who were also Christians, were mourning them. And they were concerned about when the, when the resurrection was to take place in regards to Christ's uh, coming kingdom. And he says in verse uh, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Now notice he, again, he talks about the dead as being asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, and actually, the the, uh, the translation there is a little bit off. But essentially, what it means is he's going to bring forth those who sleep through Jesus. It's not in Jesus; it's through Jesus. It's the Greek verb uh, or preposition dia, not in. So through Jesus, he's going to bring forth those who sleep. And he says, even as look at it again in um, uh, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So notice he's comparing Jesus' death and resurrection. He says, even so, the Greek there literally means in exactly this way. That is, the way Jesus died and rose again, in this way, God will bring forth with him, uh, through Jesus, those who sleep, is literally how it's worded in the Greek. Those who, not who sleep in Jesus, through Jesus. He's going to bring forth those who sleep. All right? But, but look, let's continue. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That is, the living who are changed and those who were asleep and who were just raised are all together going to be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What does Paul say we should comfort one another with? When, when someone's, someone's relative passes away, and they were a believer, all right, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, they pass away, and they're buried, and you're mourning. We as Christians are to comfort one another what are we to comfort one another with? Are we to comfort one another with, oh, they're in heaven now, walk in the streets of gold, holding hands with Jesus? No. We're to comfort them with the fact that they are coming out of that grave when Jesus sounds that trumpet at his second coming. That's what we're to comfort them with. All right? Okay. Um, I already read to you one passage that talks about the, um, the Sadducees who believe there's no resurrection. 
Is there anything in the Old Testament about people who didn't, who uh, believed in the third one, mortality? Does anybody know? How about how about uh, Psalm fourteen one? The fool has said in his heart, "What?" Somebody said it. I heard a whisper. What was that, Chrissy? There is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What does that imply? And, and why is David talking about that? If you look at the context, he's saying that because he's talking about the fool who thinks he can just live his life the way he wants to live it, and there's not going to be any retribution in the end. Right? Those are people who believe this right here, mortality. Right? They're a fool because in the end, they are going to stand before God. You know, Jesus talked about that there is to be a resurrection both of the just and the unjust. Right? The just are going to be rewarded after they're raised from the dead. The wicked are going to be punished after they're raised from the dead. That be, why? Because that's the only way they can be rewarded or punished. There is no other way to be rewarded or punished. Yes, Carl? When someone dies and they're cremated, their ashes are spread. Yep. Well, let me ask you this, Carl. God made Adam out of what? Dust out of the ground. And he said, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And then he promised the resurrection. It's no harder for God to take your dust and put you back together than it was for him to put Adam together in the first place. All right? Yeah. That the Ezekiel tribe story illustrates that, actually. That's exactly right. In fact, we're going to look at that passage in some depth uh, in a future class. All right, any other questions? Yeah, Chris. Not really a question, a comment, but um, Jesus and God never let this stuff just chance interpretation. Just like when he promised the oath to Abraham, like mm -hmm. he gave three concrete examples of the resurrection. Yes, he did. Because there was the girl, Jairus' daughter, sitting uh -huh. in the house, they were all weeping, and he said, no, Jesus. She's asleep. Her. And the Lazarus. And Lazarus, and then they both stopped. But each yep. time there were witnesses, like, yep. witnesses. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all that what, that, what those were, were absolute demonstrations before a crowd of people of the ultimate hope of the Christian. That, and you're exactly right. The Jairus' daughter, when she died, he told him, don't weep. Why? Because her ghost is floating around in heaven? No. Don't weep, he says. She's not dead. She's just asleep. And why did he say that? Because that's the way that God wants us to think of death, as sleep. All right? And resurrection, the word re for uh, being raised from the dead, even when it's talking about Jesus' resurrection, is the word which means to wake, awaken somebody. The same word that talks about in the Gospels when it talks about how Joseph uh, dreamed the dream while he was asleep and, and, and God told, or the angel Gabriel came to him in his dream and told him to take the baby Jesus into Egypt so he wouldn't be killed by Herod. Remember that story? And then it says, when he was awakened... Then he did what the angel said. Well, that's the exact same word that's used for Jesus was raised from the dead all throughout the New Testament. It's a It literally means to awaken from from uh, sleep or or being you know to get up and awake. The Bible talks about sleep or death as sleep. It talks about resurrection as awakening. It does that for a reason because that's how God wants us to view death and how He wants our hope to be in the resurrection, not in some fairy tale kind of concept that really it was developed by the pagans. Yes, Carl? What did Christ mean then on the cross when the one criminal next to him stopped him and said, take this off the cross and the other one said, forgive me, I forgive you, mm -hmm. and, and Christ said, and this day you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah, actually, the, all, all you have to do in that particular verse is understand that the comma is in the wrong place. Um, and it, it, the whole meaning of the verse is completely different than that. The way it's translated in our Bibles is incorrect, but I, I'm already past time, so I don't have time to get into all that. Actually, if you want to, I have an article on that, in a very in-depth article on that, on the um, Answers and Revelation website, if you want to go on there and look in the section on hell. Um, but we'll be dealing with that passage in our class. Uh, it'll be a while before we get there. But um, yes, sure. He who believes in me. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it's like almost like saying, you know, how God breathed life in Adam, mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ is the um, very wisdom and the word of God and the creation. 
basically saying, like, I am embodied here, and I am, like, the black God who will give life to you as well. That's right. It's not like, and, and like, but, you mentioned the apostles and, like, seeing that person would be like this. That life, that life is resurrection. The Bible talks about life. It talks about eternal life, uh, everlasting life, all throughout the Bible. It's talking about resurrection. People think that everlasting life is just this kind of spooky, mystical thing. It's not. It's the resurrection. That's what everlasting life is. It's, It's being raised back to life again to live forever. It's immortality as opposed to death. All right, we're going to actually, yes, go ahead, Eric. It says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Yes, he's talking about in the kingdom. He's talking about death and then waking up in the kingdom. But we're going to deal with all those passages uh, in, in depth, all right? And I'll show you how that, that the text is actually saying that, all right? Um, again, these are the kinds of things what we have to do is we have to apply those rules that we talked about. And when we apply those rules consistently, to that passage, to the passage Carl's talking about, and other passages, you will see that they all end up coming out the same way. All right, the problem, part of the problem is that in some cases they're poorly translated in English. In other cases, people just look at one verse and they ignore the whole context about what's being talked about in the whole context. All right, and if you just pull that one verse out of context and you view it from that perspective, yeah, it might look that way. But what you're going to see is the Bible very consistently takes us to the second view right here, both in the Old and in the New Testaments. All right? But we'll, we'll deal with all the passages that are used by modern Christians to talk about the first one, or to, you know, to try to say that the first one is, is the right one. Um, we'll deal with them in the, in the, at the right time. I don't want to get too off track from the progress that I'm trying to make here. All right, any other questions? Is that it? Okay.